I'd like to express my happiness on this occasion of talking to you for a second time. The first time we discussed what we can receive from the Dhamma or from Buddhism. This time we'll discuss how to use Dhamma usefully or how to use Dhamma successfully or how to live with the Dhamma. When we talk about the Dhamma, we mean knowledge that must be practiced, knowledge that must be practiced. When we talk about this thing that must be practiced, there are four important things that we must understand and know about. These four things are sati, mindfulness, sampajanya, wisdom in action, samati, concentration or one-pointedness of mind, and banya, wisdom. All of you, when you consider these four things, will be able to see that you have caused all four of them to arise through the practice of anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. So now we will talk about how to use these four dhammas in, and we will discuss this in detail. So we'll talk about each one of these dhammas one by one so that we can understand what they mean and what they are about. Sati or mindfulness, awareness, means to recall or to think of, to be aware of the things that we should be aware of or that we should recall. And to do this very quickly, extremely quickly, like an arrow. Another way we can um, talk about sati is as a vehicle or a transportation mechanism of the fastest kind, the fastest transporter that there is. But the kind of transportation we're talking about here is not of physical things. We're talking about the transportation of wisdom. So Siddhi is able to deliver wisdom extremely quickly and it is able to do this quick enough for our needs. And when we've been practicing Anapanasati, then we have trained Sati, mindfulness, in a very complete, in a very complete way. The second Dhamma that we're talking about is Sampajanya. Sampajanya is wisdom in action, wisdom being used, wisdom functioning to take care of problems. Sampajanya is wisdom that is right where it's needed, right there at the site of the problem in order to prevent the problem from arising or to take care of it if it has arisen. So many, some of you may have come across this word before and seen it translated as clear consciousness or clear comprehension and various other things. But now we're, we're calling it wisdom in action, wisdom that's being used. 
There are many translations of Sampajanya which tend to get us confused and we waste a lot of time worrying about which one we should use. We recommend wisdom in action, but even better than using this translation is to learn the Pali word, because the Pali word is the right word already, Sampajanya, and then you don't have to worry about the translation. The word Panya, wisdom, has very, very many meanings. It covers a huge area of ground. It covers so many things that we can't even estimate all the things that would be included under the word Banya. But this word Sampachanya is much more narrow in its meaning. And what we mean is wisdom that we need for the problem that's right in front of our face. It's the wisdom in action that is needed right here and now. And so this is a much smaller in terms, well not smaller, but it's a much more specific aspect of wisdom. Wisdom in action right here, right now to deal with the matter or the problem that we're facing. This is the same as the word Dhamma, which has an incredible amount of meanings depending on how it's being used. But when it comes to the point of Dhamma functioning in order to solve problems, then it becomes much, we can use Dhamma in a much, this word Dhamma in a much more specific and narrow meaning. And this very specific meaning, as far as of Dhamma that's related to problem solving. We can call Dhamma Satcha or truth. We can compare this with our medicine chest in our house. The medicine chest is full of all kinds of different pills and ointments and drugs that we use and we store them up. But when we're actually sick or hurt, we go to the medicine chest and choose one, one drug that will work to take care of our specific illness. And so we take that one drug that will cure our problem right here and now, and we use that drug. So with these things, Dhamma and Banya, Understand that there's an incredible amount of these, but that when we need to use it, what we actually need to use may be just a little bit. Whatever little bit or portion is needed to take care of the situation we're facing to help us deal with our problem. So, either Dhamma or Banya, that is especially relevant to the situation, to the problem, to the occasion, that is used to control the situation. This is what is called Sampajanya, Sampajanya. The third Dhamma that we will talk about is Samati, Samati. According to the, li the literal meaning of this word is for the mind to be well-founded, well-established, to be properly founded, to be appropriately established, correctly set. The Buddha gave a very broad meaning to this word and said that it is the one-pointed mind that has Nibbana or Nirvana as its object. Samati is the one-pointed mind which has Nibbana as its object. 
when we talk about this mind that is one pointed upon nibbana we can talk about three characteristics that it has the first characteristic is body sutti which means pureness purity the second one is samahita hmm. which means to be firm stead steadfast stable extremely stable and the third one is kamaniya which means to be active more than active to be extremely skillful to be expert in its function in its duty of whatever needs to be done so if you want to know whether the mind is in a state of samati or not you can examine it check out the mind and see if it has these three characteristics purity firmness stability and active very skillful expert activeness when we talk about the power or energy of the concentrated mind the mind takes all its energy and concentrates it in, on one point it's like when we take a magnifying glass and we focus the sun ra- sun's rays on one very small point so that this point can start a piece of paper on fire because the sun's rays are concentrated in one spot this is what the concentrated mind is like the mind that is samati is able to focus all the mind's power and energy on one point which which gives a level of energy that is very powerful very incredible much stronger than any other kind of power that we know this kind of mind this highly concentrated mind can be described in a couple different ways one way is as indriya <laughs> of another pali word which means supreme or great and the other one is pala which means power so samati pala very powerful so we can describe this mind as supreme or superior to all other kinds of mind and more powerful than all other kinds of mind samati must work together with banya wisdom their partners it's like a knife a knife has needs two things it needs weight or samati and sharpness wisdom or it's like so for a knife to cut anything if it is heavy but is not sharp it won't cut it will just mess up whatever we're trying to cut or if it is very sharp but has no weight it can only make a small scratch but cannot cut through whatever we're trying to cut so a knife needs both weight and sharpness and the mind to do what we need it to do needs both samati and banya so you might wonder what is it that cuts is it the weight or the sharpness when a knife cuts something is it the weight or the sharpness that does the cutting if you can understand this it will make it easier for you to understand how samati the concentrated one point in mind and wisdom banya how these two work together to cut the mental defilements so in that thing we call sampajanya the second dhamma this sampajanya has samati and banya working together within it the fourth thing to talk about is banya wisdom literally 
this word means knowing or knowledge, but not just everything there is to need to know, but specifically knowledge that we should know, knowledge that is sufficient for our needs. So of all the things we could know, Banya refers to those things we need to know, those things that if are sufficient to solve our problems. For example, we don't need to know anything about molecules and atoms or about outer space. What we do, all we need to know about is dukkha and how to take care of dukkha. So this wisdom, the things that we should know, has to do with the cessation of dukkha. It's the same as when the, this is exactly what the Buddha said. The Buddha said that other things I don't talk about. I only talk about dukkha and the end of dukkha. There is a very nice, very pleasant sounding saying of the Buddha in Pali, which I'd like you all to hear. Which means that in the past as well as in the present I speak only of dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. So the Buddha didn't have to mention the future because it hadn't happened yet. But as far as the past and the present, he only talked about these two things. As far as these things we should know, banya or wisdom, we can at this time talk about four general topics or areas of wisdom that we ought to know. First topic that I'd like you to take a look at is the three characteristics of existence or the three characteristics of all things which are anicca, impermanence, change, flux, flow, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, and anatta, non-self, non-soul, non-ego, the impersonality of all things. As far as these three things, anicca, dukkha, anatta, you can find all kinds of things about them in books. There are many books that cover these three characteristics. But we can summarize impermanence, anicca, in saying that it's the ceaseless change of all compounded things, all things that are formed, that are brought into existence through causes. Things which are not compound, compounded are not subject to the word anicca. We would not apply the word anicca to uncompounded things, only to compounded things. This, thing, this word compounded things, it'll be easier for you if you can remember the Pali word, which is sankara, sankara. Thais make it a little easier to pronounce and say sankan, sankan. But in English books, it will be spelled out sankara. Sankara means to form, to compound to put things together. It's the condition or the activity of all things, of all, all these things such as these trees that have been, are taking different causes, different things and putting them together, 
which gives rise to other things, newer things. And so the trees are growing and developing and forming leaves. The leaves drop, branches grow, fall off, bark develops, and all kinds of things. This is sankhara, the action of forming, of formation, of, of things continually, out of old things becoming new things, on and on continuously. Sankara is the things which are conditioned into existence. So, and Sankara are also, okay, then these Sankara are conditioned into existence, and then they condition other things. And so Sankara is both the things that are conditioned into existence and the things that condition other things into existence. So the sankhara we can compare, we can speak of like the bricks in a wall. Each brick props up another brick. And this, that brick props up another one, which props up another one, on and on. So all the bricks are both being propped, supported by another brick or a few other bricks and are themselves propping up, supporting other bricks. So these sankhara has this wide, wide kind of meaning. Both what is conditioned and what conditions other things. And it is both the verb to condition, the act of conditioning, and it's also the things which are conditioned and which condition. So it has various, it has very broad meaning. So Sankara has three meanings. <clears throat> First meaning is conditioning, forming, the act, the activity of conditioning or forming. The second one is things that are conditioned, that are formed. And the third meaning is the formers, the conditioners, the things that condition other things. So this first meaning of sankhara, conditioning, forming, you have to see, you have to come to know that it's in everything that without this condition of, the, of forming, of continually things forming and forming other things and conditioning other things, without this there would be no existence. There can only be existence through this continual, ceaseless conditioning and reconditioning. But sometimes this conditioning is very fine, very subtle, and we don't see it or it may be hidden, like in this rock here. There is ceaseless conditioning going on within that rock, but when you look at it, you might not see it with your, with your eyes. But we need to come to understand this. If you look at this rock, you may have difficulty seeing the conditioning. So leave the rock alone and look inside yourself is within this conditioning is going on constantly and we can see it. We can see the conditioning, we can see the things that are conditioned into existence, and we can see the things that cause the conditioning of other things. So by looking in, we can see all these things. We can see the conditioning of what we call the body aggregate. We can see the feelings, which we talked about last night. We can see this being conditioned, the feelings. We can see the conditioning of perceptions, of the distinguishing of this and that with different names and labels. We can see the thinking that is conditioned constantly. We can also see the conditioning of consciousness. So these five 
five groups, these five aggregates of existence, we can see their con the conditioning of each of these just by looking inside. We need to see the look at the contact points, the, the transmission points, such as the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. And when these transmission points, these contact points, are functioning, at that moment of their function, then there is conditioning going on, and we can watch this conditioning. So when the eyes are in the act of seeing something, we can watch this process and watch the conditioning as it happens. And the same with the ears and hearing, the nose and smelling and so forth. Even in just the body, there is constant change and conditioning going on ceaselessly. Even our cells are dying and being replaced constantly. And eventually all of them are replaced. So just by examining the body, we can see this conditioning going on all the time. In this body are the six internal sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And then there are the objects of these, sense, these senses, sights, sounds, odors, tastes, physical sensations or touches, and mind objects. When the internal sense space, such as the eye, makes contact with the sense object, such as a sight, when this contact happens, there is conditioning. When these two come together, there is conditioning. And we call this specific conditioning patsa or contact. This, con this conditioning right there at that meeting of eye and sight or ear and sound and so forth, this is called patsa. And it is the beginning point of all the conditioning. So after this contact between the sense organ and the sense object, there's contact, patsa is conditioned. This patsa conditions feeling. And then the feeling goes and conditions perceptions, different kinds of perceptions, wrong perceptions and possibly right perceptions. These perceptions further condition thinking or conceptualization. This thinking conditions action. And the action leads to further thinking, leading to more action. And it goes on and on. This is an example of what is meant by conditioning. So, just by looking inside this body, we can see this this conditioning, this sankhara going on and on and on. And it has the characteristic that it never stops. It never takes a rest. It never pauses. Whether we're asleep or awake, it's going on right here. And this is so we can call it perpetual flow, perpetual flux, ceaseless change impermanence. This, this is the condition that we call anicca, anicca. If you have insight into this first characteristic of anicca, impermanence, if you really see it, then it's not much more to understand the second characteristic, dukkha. When you see all these things constantly changing, never staying the way they are. There never really are anything because they don't even stop long enough to be something. They're constantly changing. If you see this, then it's not difficult to see the dukkha of all of it, all this impermanence, of all this conditioning. 
This dukkha means that the ugliness, the the hard to endureness, the it's it's just so difficult to live with all these things that won't stop changing. Because as soon as we want them to be one way, they change and are off doing being another way. Or if we have something we like, that we love, before we know it, it changes into something else. So these things are always causing us dukkha because they won't stay still. They keep changing. So whatever we want, it's never there. It's always becoming something else. This is the second characteristic, dukkha. So once again, we can see this within ourselves. We can see that all the things we love are anicca and dukkha. And all the things we dislike, that we don't love, these are also impermanent and unsatisfactory. So we can see that there is nothing of all these sankharas, all these conditioned things, there is nothing that is not, there is nothing that is permanent and there is nothing that is not unsatisfactory. Out of all these things, none of them are permanent and none of them are satisfying. So when you see all these things as impermanent and unsatisfying, then you will see that in them there is nothing that we can call a self. There is no permanent, unchanging, abiding entity amongst all this change and conditioning that we can call a self, that we can call myself or I or my thing. Nowhere is there any self permanent some, any permanent self-entity like this. So you'd best come, come to see that these things are not self, not, not anything, no permanent I. So instead of seeing a self, all you can see is perpetual flow, ceaseless change. And this, these, these three things, these three characteristics, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-soul, non-soul, non-self, or anicca, dukkha, anatta. These three characteristics are what we mean by banya, wisdom. Understanding these three characteristics are the knowledge that we should know. They're the things we need to know. So this is one, one of the topics of banya. The second topic under the, cat, under the word banya is sunyata, voidness or emptiness. When we come to understand the first three characteristics that made up the first topic, it's not so difficult to understand sunyata, voidness. This means the voidness in all things, that in all these things there is nothing that we can call a self. There, there is nothing that has the meaning of being a self. All these things are free of self. So to see this is sunyata. And sunyata is like the, the, the joining, the joining point, the, the summarization of these three characteristics. Sunyata sort of covers the other three, these first three. So this word sunyata has a very good meaning, very useful, fairly easy to get a hold of. 
that we can use as a principle, as a standard in our practice and in our life. So sunyata, if we understand it on the Dhamma level, voidness, on the level of awareness and wisdom, not on the physical level, then we will understand it properly. When we say voidness, we're not saying that things do not exist, that there is nothing here. That's nihilism. And that nihilism is not the meaning of sunyata. We're talking on the level of wisdom, not just on the level of physical things. Sunyata on the dam on the level of Dhamma means the absence, the emptiness of a self, that all things are free of a self, of something that can be attached to as a self. This this higher Dhamma meaning of Sunyata encompasses and gathers together the first three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. And it is this kind of knowledge that we need to destroy the, de- the mental defilements which cause all our problems. When we see voidness in the things we love, well, then we don't love them. We, when we see the voidness of the things we hate, then we don't hate them. So there is no longer love and there is no longer hate. There is no longer liking. There is no longer disliking. This is the result of seeing voidness in things, to genuinely and truly see voidness in things. And then we are neither over here or over there. We're in the middle. We're balanced. We're centered in truth. So when we're no longer liking these things and disliking, then we are free of even happiness and dukkha, of sukha and dukkha. We're free of these and we're in the middle. This is the meaning of emptiness, of voidness, and the result of seeing it. And when when we know, if we do not fully see emptiness, then we will still love some things and we will still hate other things. If you're loving things, you're going to hate some other things. If you're hating things, you're going to love some things. They come together. But if there is complete understanding of sunyata, there is neither loving or hating. When there is still loving and hating, there is still attachment to things. The mind is a slave to these things. It's under the power of these things that we love and hate. But when there is complete understanding of sunyata, when there is no longer loving or hating, then the mind is free. The mind is no longer a slave to these changing things. This is freedom, the the result of understanding voidness. And voidness is a synonym of Nibbana. So if you've been wondering what Nibbana is, it's sunyata, emptiness, voidness of self. And so when we're empty, when the mind is empty, There are no mental defilements. When there are no mental defilements, there is no heat. When there is no heat, then we're cool. Nibbana means cool. So, when there is emptiness, then there is Nibbana. The Buddha said, you ought to view the world as empty of atta and ataniya, atta, self, ego, ataniya, 
of the self, belongings of the self. So we all ought to see this world, see the world as free of self and things of the self. This is the second topic of Banya. The third matter or topic of Dhamma that needs to be understood is Itapajayata. Itapajayata is this being, this comes into being. This arises, that arises. This arises, that arises. This arises, that arises. Or this coming into being, then there's this coming into being, and this, and this, and this, and this, on and on and on. It's the same matter, the same, th- the same thing to understand as by ticha samupat, samupat, or dependent origination, which you heard a little bit about the first night. Dependent in origination or causal um, origination, it has a few different translations. They're the same thing, and you need to understand this to have a, to be racking up your banya points. If you, if you realize itapajayata, then you will see that everything in the world is flowing. It's always flowing, constantly. It's just a flow, on and on and on and on. To see this is to see itapajayata, this third topic of wisdom. There are this Itapajayata has all kinds of different details and it's a very long and complex thing. Especially when it's described in the way of Paticca Samupat. And we don't have the time for that now, so you may have to go to a book and do some reading to begin to get an idea what this is about. The fourth topic of wisdom is datata, datata, suchness or thusness. It means that everything is just that. It's just what it is. Or it's, it's to see everything as just like that. Nothing more, nothing less. Nothing different than just that. It's only that. This tatata, suchness, to understand that everything is just such. To understand this is includes the first three characteristics, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-soul. It includes emptiness. And it includes itapajayata, the law of cause and effect. This arising, that arises. This, that, this, that. So to see, to realize, datata, is to realize what everything is like, the suchness of all things. This suchness includes these first three topics of wisdom. To, to realize, to intuitively realize da ta ta, to see the truth of all things, to see the reality of all these things which are deceiving us, which are deluding us. These things that are deluding us are all the things which give rise to meaning in us. The meaning of opposites, of oppositions, of the of duality. So all these things which we are seeing in terms of duality, these are all deluding us because we don't see the truth of them. We don't see the tatata, the suchness of these things. Therefore they delude delude us and give rise to dual meanings, dualities, pairs of opposites this and that, liking and disliking, hot and cold, big and little, male and female, good and bad. 
enlightened and unenlightened. These, without, when we don't see da ta da, we're always trapped in these oppositions, in these dualities, and then we can't see the truth of these things. And when we don't see the, their truth, then this allows the mental, this causes the mental defilements to arise. And then our, we're, we're in our problems again. So when we look, we'll see that good is a sankhara. It is a conditioned thing. We'll see that evil is also sankhara. It is conditioned. We'll see that pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings, sukha and dukkha, are also sankhara. Hot and cold, left and right, all of these are sankhara, male and female. We'll see that all, there isn't anything that is not a sankhara. And when we truly realize that they're all just sankhara, we'll see that they're all the same thing, that they are all tatata. All things are just suchness, thusness. They're just what they are. We can continue on and say that heaven is a sankhara and hell is also a sankhara. Heaven and hell are nothing but datata, just that. So we ought to see that heaven, hell, good, bad, happiness, unhappiness, merit, demerit, sin, virtue, all of these are just datata, datata. And we, we should raise ourselves above these things above all this. So don't let all these dual things, all these dualistic pairs come and possess and cover and oppress the mind. Don't allow these dualistic things to give rise to liking and disliking. Don't allow them to give rise to the mental defilements. All of this, these four tops, topics, is what is known as banya, wisdom. This is the kind of knowledge we need. It is the knowledge that we must have, we must have to a sufficient degree. This is what is meant by banya, wisdom. We need to study both on the physical, material level and on the mental level or the spiritual level until there is enough wisdom, enough knowledge about things. Now we know about these four things, these four dhammas we began talking about. Sati, mindfulness, Sampajanya, wisdom in action, Samati, one-pointedness of the one-pointed mind, and Banya. We know about these four things. Next, we need to know how to use them. We need to be able to use them. So now we come to the question of how are we going to use these things? How are we going to bring these into our lives, our everyday lives, so, so that these dhammas are an ordinary, constant part of our reality. How, how are we going to do that? The short answer is that we must live a life that has these four things. We must live with these four things. We should, ha we should use these four dhammas by having them meet up with, having them 
and encounter all the problems and situations which arise in our daily lives. So the way to use these is whenever there is a situation in our life that causes a problem, such as when the eye sees something, when, this, when the eye sees a sight, an object, then mindfulness, sati, goes to wisdom and brings some wisdom to the situation, brings the necessary, the needed wisdom to the situation so that the wisdom can function, so it can do its job and solve the problem as sampajanya. So when mindfulness brings when mindfulness transports or delivers wisdom to the pla- the right place in the right time, then sampajanya, wisdom in action, deals with that situation. It prevents the problem or it solves a problem that has already arisen. This is sampajanya being used. In that moment of sampajanya, functioning. Then there is also samati. The one-pointed mind is able to summon its energy, to focus its energy on this problem, on this situation, and give strength, give weight to the sharpness of the wisdom. And so that with this weight and energy and power of samati, of the concentrated mind, then the sampajanya can cut the defilements. It can get. It can solve this problem as much with as much to the degree that there is samati. To that degree, wisdom or sampajanya will be able to solve the problem. The more concentration, the more mental power, the better. The more complete will Sampajanya solve the problem. In that moment, we'll see that we are the most clever, the most brilliant person there is, because we are able to solve the problem that we have encountered right then and right there. And then we don't become enslaved to the meanings of dualistic things, all the various pairs of opposites, that are deceiving us. We don't become their slaves. This is the free life. It's calm, peaceful. It's cool. It's the highest thing there is. It's the best thing that humans can achieve. To summarize, we must have enough wisdom Mindfulness, sati, must be able to bring that wisdom in time, quick enough. Sampajanya, wisdom in action, must be sufficient and it must be, must be sufficient and correct. And samadhi, the one-pointed mind, one-pointedness of mind, must also be sufficient and correct. Then they are able to deal with every situation that may arise. This is the answer to the original question, how are we going to use the Dhamma? I hope that each of you are able to use this so as to justify the time, the effort, and the expense that you have put forth and able to come here. So I, I hope that you do not come out of here in debt, but you make a profit by using this. So, this, this talk has run out of time.
I would like to now close the meeting.